So at the end of the world, there's a large outcropping of rock, boulders that tumble over one another at a slow incline that gets steeper and steeper until it drops off into an abyss, really. Down at the bottom, you can hear the ocean waves coming in and receding out. But on some days, you can't see that ocean. It's just covered in a mist. And so as you look over the edge of the cliff, you're looking out into nothingness. I know this about the end of the earth because I walked there last spring. I walked for 500 miles from France over the Pyrenees Mountains and then across northern Spain along a route called the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. And it's a route that lots of pilgrims walk, actually hundreds of thousands of people. And they've been doing it for thousands of years. Um, and I had the great privilege of being there at the end of the world for a number of days. Uh, I got to walk up that hill and to that rocky outcropping and jump from boulder to boulder, or in some places, cling <laughs> from boulder to boulder as I shimmied down, in order to get that view of that vastness. I was seeking the awe of that experience. I wanted to kind of face that nothingness uh, and have that time with myself. But on one of the days that I was there, <laughs> these people came sort of crowding into my space. It was a little off-putting. It was a little weird. I was like, why are you here? <laughs> this is my boulder. <laughs> um, and through the language of the Camino, which is like a mix of Spanish and English and like wild hand gesturing and a lot of laughing, uh, this family, this mother and father and uncle and their black lab told me about why they were there at my boulder. They were there to say goodbye to their 19-year-old son who had died the year before of cancer. He had struggled for several years and had succumbed, and so they had walked the Camino as a prayer for his life. And suddenly it wasn't my boulder anymore. <laughs> In fact, I felt super awkward. I was like, I, I shouldn't be here. This is, this is far too personal. Like, I don't know what to say. And they said, no, no, come, come, come. And so I, I, I did, I stayed. And they pulled out of their pockets things that belonged to their son, these pieces of his life and of his illness, and they made a little fire. It was protected from the wind um, that was coming up off of the ocean because it was built right back behind that boulder. And we stood there together, praying. And I don't know what the family was saying inside themselves, but I do know that uh, it was profound. And this vast ocean that was moving all the time with us became even more awesome in the prayer for this young man's life. I have a quote for you from Anne Lamott. She says, when we are stunned to the place beyond words, we're finally starting to get somewhere. And that's exactly how I felt in that moment with this family, who then, you know, at the very end of it all, we sort of dropped back into real time and hugged each other and the dog was jumping up on us again and they gathered up what was left of their things and, and left me to my boulder. <laughs> I 
I'm sharing this story with you because well, because it was such a profound moment for, for my life, my living. And the fear of not knowing what to do in that moment was matched and really ultimately outweighed by the incredible power of being together with this family in their loss. It's a really intimate thing to walk 500 miles. Um, it's, it's a way in which you get to know yourself very profoundly if you allow it to be. It's like a moving meditation. And if anyone in here has sat meditation, maybe this will resonate for you. You sit for a while and your mind is racing and then you sit for a while longer, and the thoughts are kind of tumbling over one another. And so then you sit for a while longer, and you start to notice, oh, there's that same thought again. I think that thing a lot. I have that anxiety a lot. I feel that fear often. Here it is again. Here's that grouchiness. And then after a while, the thoughts just start to kind of lose their hold on you. And this is what happened for me as I walked day after day after day. You know, the thought that I often thought was, my feet hurt. <laughs> you know, my feet really hurt. But it, but it wasn't actually such a big deal to have my feet hurt. And so I would just keep walking. You know, my back hurts. Um, you know, I'm worried about whether or not I'm going to find an, a place to stay at the end of this day. There were a lot of worries for me as I was walking the Camino. A lot of worries for me as I prepared to go on that journey. And they say that the Camino is sort of like a an echo of your life. It's a it's a microcosm of what it is to live this human existence. And so every day I was having to sort of face myself, to see myself, to work with myself. Um, and so on that day when the family arrived on that boulder with me and there was the fear coming up and there was their generosity offering me to come closer. Um, I chose to go with the generosity rather than listen to the fear because I'd had days and days and days, weeks and weeks, to recognize that the fears that I was experiencing didn't really pan out in the way that I had anticipated them to. And I found lots of awe while I was walking, lots, beauty, just everywhere, incredible people who came in and out of that experience. According to psychology today, awe can be described as an overwhelming feeling associated with vastness, reverence, wonder, and at times, a touch of fear. A sense of transcending day-to-day -day human experience in the presence of something extraordinary. Awe is inspired by objects or events that are considered to be greater than yourself, such as genius, great beauty, extreme power, and impact, or sublimity. I think on that boulder that day, that really was a sublime thing to be invited in. It was a sublime thing to be seeing th this family in their incredible grief. It was an, a sublime thing to then have that moment end and just go back to sitting there with my chocolate and my wine. Like, <laughs> what a weird thing. <laughs> in that same article, Psychology Today says that awe consists of two qualities, the perception of vastness and the stimulus, which is far greater than ourselves, and a cognitive accommodation, 
where our minds can't easily assimil assimilate the stimulus, so we instinctively take in as much information as we can. I love what that says about what it means to be human, that our sense of awe is an instinctive reaction, that it puts us in a place of deep curiosity and deep love for the world around us, that when we are struck by that sense of being overwhelmed by what it is that we're experiencing, our instinctive nature is to open up wider. That's awe. Einstein describes it as the source of all true art and science, which means that awe is not only distinct, instinctive, but it's also generative and creative. It moves us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do in our lives. It offers us an invitation into transformation. I think we all have events, you were invited earlier in the meditation to think about those times when you've been in a, in a state of awe or where fear maybe has led you toward awe. I have some that you could consider. So there's the standing at the ocean's edge and allowing yourself to gaze out as far as you possibly can and recognizing that the ocean is so large that out past your gaze, there's only more water. And then thinking about the fact that that water, the salinity of that water, almost exactly matches the salinity of the plasma in our own blood and bodies. And that our blood is pumped through our bodies with the motion of a heart that echoes the motion of the waves. That's awesome. It's incredible. How about this one? Like, standing outside under the stars and contemplating the vastness of outer space. Thinking about the amount of time it takes for starlight to leave wherever it was generated and to travel to us so that it hits our cornea and our retinas and signals to us star. And that star could be long dead. The light has been traveling for millions of years. That's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah, awesome. What are some awe-inspiring moments from your life? And I'm really asking you this question. Robin and I are going to hear from some of you. Um, so be thinking a little bit about what is awesome to you, OK? I'm going to give you one last example before we generate some from you all. Um, Skiing, have any of you, do you love, does anybody here love skiing? A few, there's a couple hands out there. Okay, so that sense of like sliding down the mountain on your own, on your own strength and you don't know if you might hit the next skier, right? You have to like be super aware, hyper aware and there are trees around you and bumps and the snow is flying in your face, that feeling of like no control and needing to be in control, that is an awesome one too. So what are some things from you, for you? I would love to see a show of hands and Robin and I are gonna come around and just hear from you. Yeah. For me, witnessing the moment of birth and the moment of death. Touching clay and letting go of any concept of what's going to erupt from it and just being part of the process. Yes. When in their moment, there's so many tiny baby animals, so many tiny frogs, you can't step without stepping on them. Or when the sand crabs come out and the wave comes in and goes out and you can't even see the sand. <laughs> that. Um trying to explain to my child who's gotten into space lately how, how big it actually is. Uh, she has a poster where the earth is, is not even a centimeter across and it says on it, if, if we tried to show the stars in this poster, they would have to be 100 miles away for the nearest one. Oh. And just the scale and trying to impart that to a child. 
running or cross-country skiing through a, an isolated valley. Yeah. Realizing that we're drinking the same molecules of water that have gone through every living creature in the earth before, including the dinosaurs. Mm. In my creative um, moments of my art also is receiving a, a word and then taking that word and letting it evolve and researching it and seeing what else comes to me. And I feel like it's exactly what I'm there to receive. One unforgettable morning uh, in Florida in my early 20s, driving west to east, seeing the sunrise and huge spider webs covered with glistening dew. It was just an incredible drive across mm. Florida for three hours. Mm. We'll take a few more. Uh, standing outside during the ice storm and just listening to the silence and then hearing these slams as the trees just randomly dropped. When the geese go off the Fern Ridge res Reservoir in the morning, there are thousands of them, and it goes bang. And it's because their wings are flapping together. It's incredible. Playing music um, by myself or with a group, those rare moments when the music just seems to flow through you and everything just comes out perfect. When I was younger, I would go into the Steen Mountains with my family and we would sit on top of a ridge and we would watch the storms come in. Mm -hmm. It was the most amazing show that I've ever seen. We'll do one more. Standing on top of the lookout at Larch Mountain in the uh, gorge and seeing the entire Cascade Mountain Range and the gorge at the same time, and the awesome beauty of, of Oregon. Oh, thank you, everybody. It's wonderful for you to share your stories of awe, because it helps me feel that sense of awe. I don't know about all of you, but hearing each of those things, it just, like that sense of reverence is building and building for me. Like I can go there with you and hear the geese or see the storms come in. I just thank you so much. So we've all, did I turn it off? No, okay. So we've all had these experiences and I guess what I want to talk to you today about is the fact of th that gift, the incredible power that we have the capacity to resonate with the beauty of the planet, with the beauty that arises within us, with those moments of birth and death. Walking the Camino really very profoundly altered my life. And it's, <laughs> it doesn't really look like it from the outside. Like all of the outside structures of my life look exactly the same. I'm working here in this wonderful church. I live in the same beautiful home, um, raising children with my lovely husband. Like all of those things are still the same. And yet there was a thing that happened inside of me as I walked those hundreds of miles. It was this little shift and it was very slight, but I think it was very profound. And I now look back at that moment when that family invited me to be witness with them to the loss of their son as a moment that impacted all of the choices that I've made since I've come back from the Camino. I think I've talked about this with you all before. I'm in a chaplaincy training program. And essentially, that's what I'm doing in that program every day that I go to the hospital, is I am 
sitting and witnessing with families in their deepest, most difficult, most traumatic, most profound transformations in the, the lives of their loved ones. And it's an incredible gift to be walking alongside people and offering them my love, my empathy. It's awesome. And there's nothing to do, right? There's no fix that is required of us when we are in a state of awe, when we are in a state of that open and curious love. We just are there watching, being present for one another. These moments of vulnerability in people's lives, they're things that we have a hard time looking at, I think, or a hard time accepting or acknowledging or wanting to be close to the realities of, of um, you know, motor vehicle accidents or <sighs> falls off of ladders. Who knew? That's a big one. Um, it's hard to be looking at the in the face of our own vulnerability, our own mortality, our own um, inevitable ending. And fear rises up if we think about it too much, but the reality is, is that it is inevitable. And I think that part of what happens when we spend some time meditating, walking with, being present with, the realities of our vulnerability as humans is that we become more prone to states of awe because it's like, well, each moment that we're living is a miracle, really. Like this one here that we're sharing together. It's incredible that you all made it here, that we're all here together that we can lift our voices in song with one another. I want to share a story with you about um, a moment about a month ago. I'd been in CPE, this training, uh, for two months, and I had a day where I just felt absolutely overwhelmed by all of it. Like it was just too much. It's too much. It's too much that people just keep dying. <laughs> And so I, I took the day off, I left at noon, and I took myself out to the woods. And I was driving very carefully. <laughs> and I got out to the woods, and I had in my backpack, I had like a, a journal with me, and I had a pack of tarot cards, because that's a thing that I've been getting more interested in. And I had a plan for what I was going to do. And I pull up to an empty lot, because it was the middle of the day on a weekday, and right behind me pulls up another person in a different car. And all of my fear started going, like, oh, this is weird, and I don't want to hike, and what if this person is like walking beside me, and what if he's an axe murderer? So I pull my car out, and I go to the next stop, where there's an empty lot, and then right behind me comes somebody else in their car. And at this point, I'm like, well, if I keep doing this, I'm not going to be able to take my hike in nature. So I'm just going to park my car, and I'm going to hike my hike, and I'm, I'm going to take my cell phone with me, and that'll help me be safe. <laughs> I don't know. These things we do, right? <laughs> And so I hiked for a while, and I got to a place by a stream, and I wrote in my journal, and I flipped through my tarot cards, and I, and I did those things to help me feel more centered and calm, more at peace with the realities that I'd been experiencing. And the other person wasn't anywhere around. I don't know where they went. But as I was hiking back, it was starting to get dark, and I'm getting more like anxious about getting back down the hill. And you can hear, right? Anxiety is a thing that plays with us a lot, me anyway. And I got back to my car, and the other person's car was still there, and I didn't know where he was. And so I throw my gear in the back, and I throw my car into reverse, and I put on the gas, and my car's wheels just spin. 
I'm like, what is going on? So I put on a little more gas and the car wheels just spin. And I get out and I'm looking at my tires to see if there's anything that's stopping me from being able to leave, to move. And there's nothing that I can see. And I'm thinking, well, did I find like the only patch of quicksand in Oregon? <laughs> like, what is going on here? And after a few minutes of this, like it really took me a long time. I realized that in my anxiety and my fear when I had parked my car, I had put it on the e-brake. And so I had my emergency brake on and it was stopping me from going where I needed to go. <laughs> Do you see what I'm trying to, to like illustrate for you here? That fear was stopping me from making any sort of movement in, in that moment. But then you see, right, how fear can stop us from making movement in our lives. <laughs> I took off the e-brake and I'm driving down the highway and there's this tingling sense at the back of my neck that like rose up my spine and up the back of my skull as I realized, like I had this moment of just realizing what a metaphor this is for so many things that I face in my life where my anxiety throws on the brake and stops me from seeing the wonder or the beauty or the awe of the moment. And when I let go of the fear, when that rope finally catches, I'm able to be there with the awe. It's, it's profound. Here's another quote from Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. I really love that quote. I've been told that chaplaincy training is like miracle grow for being a human. You just, I would highly recommend it to anyone, but you just are faced with our human vulnerability and frailty, and that is juxtaposed by the incredible strength that we all hold within us as people, as families. It's a daily thing, this process of giving birth and of letting go and dying. It's happening all the time. And it is incredible. It's incredible to be able to be with that and not do anything. The families gathering at the bedside of their loved ones, I'm learning that there are five things that we do in that process. We say, I, I forgive you. We say, please forgive me. We say, thank you. We say, I love you. We say goodbye. And I think back to that day on that cliff with those boulders and that family and their process of doing those five things so beautifully and what an incredible lesson that's been in my growth and my maturing as a person. And I don't think we have to wait to the end to feel the awe of doing those five things, or maybe four of them. We can hold on to each other a little longer. Here's one last quote. I gave you a little bit of it at the beginning. It's from Anne Lamott from Help, Thanks, Wow. When we are stunned to the place beyond words, we're finally starting to get somewhere. It is so much more comfortable to think that we know what it all means, what to expect, and how it all hangs together. When we are stunned to a place beyond words, when an aspect of life takes us away from being able to chip away at something until it's down to a manageable size, and then to file it nicely away, when, we, when all we can say in response is, wow, that is a prayer.
And so I invite you to join with me now in saying, wow, wow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>